This video is brought to you with the support of Truefire. Learn, practice, and play with Truefire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where we're interested in you get the most music from the least gear. In 1974, I was playing my Epiphone 12 string in the folk group at St. John's in Clyde, New York. Folk groups were a new thing, and each week we endured the scowls of the little old ladies that sat in the front row as we played this new music in church. And I can't blame them, really. Our fearless leader, Joni McAllister, would work up an instrumental version of John Lennon's Imagine and play it during the communion service. The teenagers smirked at the lyrics playing in their heads, and the parents and grandparents thought it was just pretty. <laughs> it was an amazing experience to be playing live music every Sunday with three other guitarists and a bassist. And that bassist, my good friend Andy Davis, played a white Univox copy of a Mose Wright Ventures model bass. I had no idea what it was, but we all thought the guitar looked wonderfully odd, somehow upside down and yet perfectly correct all at once. So if you always wanted to know the history of this incredibly influential guitar company, then stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of Mose Wright guitars. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, grab a hoodie or a Stomp preset pack to support what we do. And to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, sign up for the Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. The links are in the description. Mosley Guitars was founded in 1956 by Andy and Semi Mosley. The boys had both been playing guitar in a gospel group and in and around Bakersfield, California by the time they were in their early teens. Almost immediately, they had begun experimenting with modifying their guitars, refinishing the instruments, and building new necks for them. Semi began his formal education building guitars as an apprentice at Rickenbacker in 52. There, he worked with Roger Rossmeisel, who played a large role in sculpting the design of Rickenbacker guitars. Rossmeisel had immigrated to the U.S. from Germany and brought his old-world luthier techniques, integrating them into manufactured guitars. Remember that Rickenbacker has always been a company with a lot of hand finishing on their guitars and is, even today, more like the Fender Custom Shop than like Fender's main modern manufacturing. It was even more so back in the 50s. One of the most recognizable features that Ross Meisel was responsible for is what is referred to as a German carve, a steep scoop from the outside of the top to the height of the center section. This was carried over to the design of the early Mosray guitars. Semi also apprenticed with Paul Bigsby, the man credited with designing and custom building the first solid body electric guitar for Merle Travis in 1948. Bigsby also designed the famous Bigsby vibrato tailpiece used on so many guitars and that are still produced today. After sharing that he was building some custom guitars on the side with his fellow employees at Rick, Semi was let go and was forced to go out on his own. In 54, Semi would build both a triple neck and a double neck guitar. Through connections, he was able to present the double neck to Joe Mafis, a Los Angeles area country guitarist that was on TV at the time. He go on to make several twin neck guitars for Mafis, often with the performer's name inlaid on the fretboard. The Mosley brothers had long worked with gospel minister Ray Boatwright. Reverend Boatwright decided to invest in the Mosley brothers company. The story goes that the Reverend took the brothers to Sears and co-signed for them to buy a bandsaw, a drill press, belt sander, air compressor, and the other small tools needed to set up their custom guitar business. The company name is actually a combination of the Mosley and Boatwright names to recognize the Reverend's early support of the endeavor. Correctly pronounced Mose Wright, by the way. In addition, the Reverend let the boys set up their shop in his one-car garage. In 1956, they finished their first official Mose Wright guitar. From that influx of equipment in 56 until 59, they were strictly a custom build shop, working in garages or storage sheds wherever they could wrangle a place to set up their equipment. In 59, Andy Mosley moved to Nashville for a year to promote the Moserite brand names and sold a few guitars to members of the Grand Old Opry and other road musicians. These were still one-off custom guitars. Later that year, Semi moved the build operations from Los Angeles to Oildale, California, just north of Bakersfield. Growing in visibility, he then moved to Panama Lane, where he designed and produced the first Joe Mafis signature model guitars. Coming from their all-custom roots, Moserite built everything but the tuners, knobs, and screws in-house. The large pickups were hand-wound in those early years as well. Semi then moved his shop to Bakersfield. He continued to evolve his custom designs, producing what are referred to as the scroll guitars for their double scroll cutaways. 
In 61, some early Moserite guitars caught the attention of the Standell Amplifier Company. Their high-powered amps had been giving Fender some direct competition, being used players like Joe Maphis and Merle Travis. Standell's founder, Joe Crooks, was interested in offering a line of guitars, and he was approached by Semi Mosley at the NAMM show, where he agreed to take delivery of 10 instruments. Crook, in the end, was not happy with the quality of the first 10 guitars delivered. This led to a meeting where Crooks told Semi that he wanted guitars that were as close as possible to the Fender line. He emphasized that the guitars needed to come up to the standard of the Standell amplifiers. Mosley returned to Bakersfield and began working on a design with employee Joe Hall that would evolve into the iconic Moserite body style. Stratocaster, the new design's lower bout would extend further forward than the upper horn. As popular as the Stratocaster was, this immediately caught your attention as it looked like a Strat that was upside down. The pickups likewise immediately drew your eye. The bridge pickups pull pieces had a straight alignment with the string, but the next pickups was angled so that the pull pieces would still be located directly under each string, as we'd seen on early Mosley designs. The fretboard inlays were tiny dots, with two of them at the first octave, three on the twelfth fret, and one again higher up. There was a round black plastic plate that wrapped around the base of the vibramute vibrato. The angle of the set neck did not allow for the adjustment to the vibramute, and was attached to the top of the guitars, so the strings would end up too high over the fretboard. To deal with this, Semi hollowed out a cavity approximately .375 inches deep to mount the mechanism. It was then covered with that black plastic plate. This would be corrected in later designs, but the earliest Moserite design guitars came with what came to be called the Mistake Plate among vintage guitar collectors. The guitars intended for Standell would have a flat top of the headstock instead of the M shape of the Moserite guitars. But in the end, the work with Standell would end up being just a footnote as the Standell guitars never attracted too much attention and were dropped. But it was the struggle to satisfy the Standell contract that led to the classic Moserite silhouette. The guitar started out without a name, but were soon labeled the Joe Maphis signature model. They corrected the body design to accommodate the vibrato and launched a production double neck guitar as well. Gene Moles was an early player from California who had a few early Moserite guitars. In 1960s, he'd moved to Tacoma, Washington and become friends with Noki Edwards of the Ventures, who'd had a big hit with their cover of Johnny Smith's Walk, Don't Run that year. They even wrote some tunes together that year, but soon Moles would head back to Bakersfield and Edwards would be back out on the road with the Ventures. Predictably, perhaps, Moles introduced Edwards to Semi Mosley. At the meeting, Edwards looked over the Moserite guitars and according to Edwards, he bought one on the spot for $300. Edwards cut a deal with Moserite that he would be paid a commission on any guitar sold from a referral from his use of the instrument. He's supposed to have left the guitar on a stand on stage on the brakes so that when the audience came up to see the guitar he was playing, they could get a good look. According to Edwards, this really worked, and they sold a lot of guitars for Moserite. Following the release of their 63 album, The Ventures Play Telstar, the rest of the band got on board with Moserite, getting instruments and investing in the company. An international distribution office was opened in Hollywood, right next door to the headquarters of the Ventures fan club. Both the Ventures and Moserite logo were now on the headstock when they were released in 63 based on the early Joe Maphis models. They had a set neck, a side jack, and a bound body. The guitar's scale length was 24 and a half inches and the matching bass was 30 and one quarter inches. The Ventures appeared on the back of their album, The Ventures in Space, released in early 64 holding Moserite instruments and with a note that the guitars were, quote, courtesy of the Moserite Distribution Company and with the address of the Distribution Company office and the fan club also listed there. On February 9th, 1964, the Beatles would make their first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. 
Perhaps the most significant moment in rock history, and with the explosion of the British music invasion, so too did the demand for electric guitars likewise explode. Here were the Ventures and Moserite in the first band and brand partnership poised to take advantage of all this new demand. The success of the Ventures model guitars forced Semi to open a real factory at 1500 P Street in downtown Bakersfield that year. I reached out to Truefire to be my sponsor because I've used them for years. With over 2 million users worldwide, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, Truefire has lessons to enhance and inspire your playing. Get 35% off courses using the promo code 5WATT35, or like I do, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Sign up now to start your journey to being a better guitarist. I'd like to thank Truefire for their support in making this video. This move to production instruments brought many changes to the Ventures model guitars. The body binding was removed and the set neck was replaced by a bolt-on neck. The unusual neck plate shape led to it being dubbed the peanut plate. The frontline guitar would be later dubbed the Mark I and the bass the Mark X. There was a move to a smaller Ventures logo on the headstock and the Vibra mute would be modified with the muting system removed. That October, the Ventures released Walk Don't Run Volume 2, essentially a remake of their 1960 hit album, featuring Don Wilson's wife Nancy Bacon and all the guys lounging behind her holding up their Moserite guitars. Going into 65, Moserite had over 100 employees at their factory on P Street. They acquired the Dobro Resonator Instrument Company and began gearing up to build amplifiers and effects pedals as well. The Ventures line expanded, adding a student model called the Ventures 2. This was designed to compete with Fender's Music Master and Duosonic Guitars and Gibson's Melody Maker. The Mark V had a narrower headstock, a slab body without the German carved top, smaller pickups, and a different vibrato design from the Vibramute. This idea was launched by older brother Andy, and at first Semi resisted, but in the end the guitars were launched at $100 less than the Mark I. Sadly though, it had different features, it would end up costing the same to produce as the Mark I, and the model was dropped. But as we'll see, this model is important because in the mid-70s, Johnny Ramone would fall in love with the single pickup rarity, playing a Ventures 2. The truss rod adjustment was moved from the base of the neck to the headstock with a unique cover plate shape. In 66, a 12-string Ventures model with the predictable name of the Mark 12 was launched. It was even available with a vibrato, which is very rare for a 12-string. Interestingly, the factory sunburst finishes on the guitars included a cream undercoat that would then make the three-tone sunburst pop out more. In addition, candy apple red and metallic finishes were available, both as standard and as special order. 1966 saw the base model move to a two-pickup configuration and the control layout move to being similar to the guitars, another step in moving to simplifying the mass production of the guitars. The basses also moved to a tuner that was produced in-house. Unfortunately, they used die-cast pop metal and were hence more unstable. Collectors would dub these duck foot tuners. Meanwhile, the Ventures attained godlike status in Japan, and so the demand for Moserite guitars has been very strong there since the 60s, with guitars being shipped there throughout the company's entire history. Young players in the 60s saw Moserites as an alternative to Fender and Gibson, but the guitars were often out of the price range of what a young player could afford. So if you could swing a Moserite, it generally gave you a boost in respect of other players. Somewhat ironically, the musicians that would put Bakersfield country music on the map were known for playing Telecasters, not Moserites. The narrow neck and flatter frets that appealed to many didn't find fans among the telly-wielding local country guys. With their hotter wound pickups, Moserites couldn't make the twanging tones they were looking for. In general, a pickup that is higher output will have a warmer tone. This is why the early broadcasters are often cited as more balanced than the later Telecaster pickups. They were hotter and hence warmer than the pickups that came later. Though the original Joe Maphis model had, for all practical purposes, been rebranded as the Ventures model, Mosray continued to build the Joe Maphis two-neck model. In 65, they redesigned the guitar for a single-neck Joe Maphis model, which they named the Joe Maphis Model 1. Mosray tried to build this into a line standing on its own with 6 and 12 string guitars along with a bass model. They would also offer a series called the Combo, which had a similar proportions to the Joe Maphis 2 guitars, but had an F-hole and a hybrid semi-hollow construction.
a step further in the semi hollow direction with their Celebrity Series guitars. They had laminated maple, symmetrical archtop bodies much like the Gibson 335 or Guild Starfire guitars. They even moved to pickups to line up with the strings, breaking with the Moserate tradition or angled neck pickups on all the other models. Interestingly, they never developed the ability to produce the laminated tops, backs, and rims in-house. Moserite bought them from a furniture manufacturer in the Carolinas. The guys at the factory then pulled the finished guitars together. By the 67 catalog, the line would be expanded to include 6 and 12 string guitars and a bass as well. Some of the models had new modified two-piece vibrato system with the tailpiece bolted to the body separate from the bridge. The Celebrity One Line instruments were two and three quarters inches thick, and Glenn Campbell was known for using one in the studio for recording. The CE2 instruments were generally the same, except they moved down to a body depth of 1.875 inches and went on to a smaller offset headstock shape. The CE3 models were designed as a no-frills, budget-style instrument with the same body depth as the CE2. They had unbound necks and single-layer body binding, and the pickups did not have pole pieces. Also interestingly is that the CE3 bass was the only production Moserate bass with a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length. Like Fender, the company would build acoustic guitars, but it was never a primary part of their business model. As I'd mentioned earlier, Moserite felt a need to take advantage of the amplifier and effects market as well. The best known of these was a pedal named the Fuzzrite. As the name implies, the fuzz pedal even looks a bit like the Gibson Maestro fuzz of that era, right down to the shape and the control placement but the tone was said to have more sustain and to be nastier. The pedal was used by Danny Weiss, the guitarist in the band Iron Butterfly, and Hendrix reportedly used a fuzz right when recording Spanish Castle Magic on Electric Ladyland. By 67, the Ventures had become increasingly unhappy with their relationship with Moserite and severed their connection that year. They still played Moserite guitars, but also used Fenders in the studio and live. In the wake of losing the Ventures as their primary publicity machine, Glenn Campbell's use of the Mark 12 12 string was important to the brand, being shown prominently on his Gentle On My Mind album cover. After the distribution company, funded and run by the Ventures organization, folded, Moserite briefly tried to do their own distribution, but they lacked the experience and soon shut down that effort. In 68, they cut a deal with Thomas Organ, who was also then distributing Vox in the U.S., but that too failed, putting Moserite at even greater risk of getting their products into the stores. Their financial problems continued to escalate, and the IRS became involved. They began having trouble covering payroll, and top managers seeing the end was coming began to jump ship. The end of Moserite's golden age came on Valentine's Day 1969, when employees arrived at work to find the factory doors padlocked. A few months later, there was a bankruptcy auction where not only machinery but guitar bodies, necks, and dobro parts were sold to local luthiers, both professional and amateur. This would cast doubt on the authenticity of some late 60s Moserite guitars, as many were pieced together after the factory was long closed. By 72, Semi had been able to negotiate himself back into the factory space on P Street, and after a three-year break was building guitars, he had a distribution deal with custom amplifiers. In a rough catalog that year, they offered solid body guitars that had been in the Mark series, and there were also celebrity models. In 73, they launched the 300 and 350 model guitars, interesting slab body single cutaway models with one or two pickups, respectively. The 70s version of the company would get an unexpected boost when New York guitarist John Cummings, aka Johnny Ramone, began using one of the Ventures 2 models. The Ramone's iconic punk rock sound was driven by these classic guitars. Cummings bought the used guitar at Manny's Music in New York on January 24, 1974. He reportedly loved the Moserite's lightweight and its thin neck that was great for his heavy use of bar chords. He would own several Moserites in his career, including a Mark I, but the guitar most often associated with him was the White Ventures II that went through numerous modifications. Leroy Sugarcoat Bonner, guitarist and vocalist with the funk soul band The Ohio Players, was often seen playing a Joe Mapis double neck guitar. Ricky Wilson of the early alternative band, the B-52s, also used Moserites, his favorite being a Blue Ventures Mark V that was used on many of the band's earliest recordings. The 70s saw many Moserites being shipped to Japan to meet the demand for the nostalgia over American surf music there. The story goes that Semi contacted the Ventures during this time asking for permission to use the band name on the guitars again. The band said no, <laughs> but Mosley put the name on the guitars anyway during the 70s and 80s. The beginning of the 80s, Semi moved the business to Carson City, Nevada. Though he yearned to return to Bakersfield, his interest in a career in gospel music instead sent him to moving to Jonas Ridge, North Carolina, his wife Loretta's hometown, 
located high up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. He planned to build custom guitars to help finance their gospel aspirations. In 83, a fire destroyed not only the factory, but many guitars that were slated to be shipped to the lucrative Japanese market. After that, Semi would put up several shacks to house his building operations. In the 80s and into the 90s, Moserite was doing what Fender and Gibson were doing at the time, doing their best to recreate the magic of the instruments that were built during their golden era. The difference being that Leo Fender and Ted McCarty were long gone from those companies, and Semi Mosley was still at the helm of the many times reconstituted Moserite guitars. During that time, Alice in Chains guitarist Jerry Cantrell used a Candy Apple Blue Ventures model. And of course, that lover of oddball guitars, Kurt Cobain, used a Moserite Gospel model, an incredibly rare guitar built when Mosley was building guitars under that name in North Carolina. Robert Smith of The Cure was often seen sporting a Moserite, and Kevin Shields of My Bloody Valentine rocked one as well. I spoke with my friend Rick Beato about the use of these guitars as a secret weapon in heavy music. He said that the unique pickups both cut through and often sat perfectly in the mix, enhancing the more common Gibson and Fender guitar tones. Mosley passed away in 1992, and his wife Loretta continued to market his instruments for approximately another year. His daughter, Dana Mosley, is a luthier and builds his designs to the present day. Oscar Wilde said, Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. A number of companies have built Moserite look-alike guitars over the years, one of the most notable being Univox, who built guitars that clearly copied the style of the Moserite Ventures model guitars and basses during Moserite's heyday in the 60s under the name High Flyer. They copied the style, but not the electronics, using more traditional P90-style pickups or humbuckers on the guitars and basses. And today, you can see the influence in the Eastwood Sidejack guitar line. Check out the excellent demos of the different Eastwood models played by my buddy RJ Ronquillo here on YouTube. It's sometimes easy to forget that there were many guitar brands beyond Fender, Gibson, Gretsch, and Rickenbacker that left their mark during the explosion of electric music in the 60s. Unlike a lot of these companies, Moserite started out building custom instruments by hand before demand would drive them into a factory environment that, looking back, they were ill-equipped to run. It takes such an amazing combination of skills to be a guitar designer and builder, and those skills don't often include running a company. But that doesn't mean that the guitars built then haven't had a long-lasting impact on the guitars of today. You only have to look at the innovative artists that used Moserite guitars both then and since to understand the unique qualities that they had. It's for these reasons that a brand from the 60s can still cast a shadow on the guitar industry of today. First, I need to thank Michael Robinson, owner of Eastwood Guitars, for his permission to use the clip of my friend RJ Ronquillo playing their Sidejack models that are inspired by the original Moserite guitars. I'd like to thank Carter Vintage for their permission to use the clip of J.D. Simo playing an original Moserite Mark guitar. This video would not have been possible without the extraordinary book, Bakersfield Guitars, The Illustrated History, by Willie G. Mosley. It's an incredible reference and does an amazing job of outlining the entire Moserite story. I need to thank the folks at Vintage Guitar Oldenburg for permission to use the video of Tobias Hoffman playing an original 1968 Moserite combo, Mark I. I need to thank everyone that stopped by the store and grabbed a hoodie or a Stomp preset pack. In particular, I need to thank the friends of 5 Watt. They're all 5 Watt world. I just make the videos. If I missed your favorite guitar or guitarist from Moserate's history, leave it in the comments for everyone to enjoy. If you enjoyed this short history of Moserate guitars, hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. And if you like this video, you might enjoy my history of Dan Electro or something more mainstream from the 5 Watt world short history catalog. Until next time, I'm Keith Williams. Thanks for being a part of the 5-Watt World.